Hello. Hi, everybody. Here we are. Thanks every, to everyone for attending. This is a great turnout. We're very excited about tonight's presentation. Uh, it's another of the continuing legal education seminars offered by Antonian Miranda at the low, low price of free. <laughs> uh, tonight, we have for you two distinguished speakers, and they're going to be providing you information on the new rules of professional conduct that just came out November of 2018. We're going to be able to cover a lot of the changes, but not all of the changes. There's been 70 new changes to the professional conduct codes. Want to first introduce the Honorable Frank Burchak. He is the judge in East County Department 7. For those family law attorneys, you are well acquainted with Judge Burchak. He has provided in your materials tonight a side-by-side -side comparison of the changes in the professional conduct codes. And that, my friends, is worth the price of admission. Oh, wait. The price of admission was free. It's, it's gold, trust me. This is information you're going to want to have at your fingertips. We also have with us tonight Ed McIntyre, ethics guru. He's been a fixture in the San Diego legal community for over 40 years. He practiced as complex business trial lawyer for the firms Solomon and Ward, Gray, Carey, Ames, and Fry. He's a professional responsibility lawyer, co-editor of San Diego Lawyer, author of numerous ethics articles, co-chair of the San Diego County Bar Association Legal Ethics Committee, he now focuses on legal ethics, professional responsibility, risk mitigation. He advises lawyers and their firms, serves as an expert witness, and tonight is going to make you very glad that you came. With no further ado, I will turn the seminar over to our speakers. Thanks, Mark. Let's start out very briefly with an introduction. How did we get here? And I don't mean did you drive or walk through the rain. Uh, back at the end of 2014, the California Supreme Court thanked and excused the first Rules Revision Commission, which had been laboring in the salt mine for more than a decade trying to revise the rules of professional conduct, and instructed the Board of Trustees of the State Bar summon up a second rules revision commission. We want a new set of rules and we want them delivered to us in basically two years by the end of March 2017. And the focus is, should be get California as best one can, uh, coincident with the national rules, which is the ABA model rules and all the other states that follow the model rules in one fashion or another. And we want basically black letter rules, not aspirational statements of what would be a nice thing for lawyers to do. We're talking about discipline rules. Uh, the Rules Revision Commission, the second one, went to work. They eventually proposed and delivered to the Board of Trustees, which delivered to the California Supreme Court by the end of March of 2017. 70 proposed either new or revised rules. The court, in an order of May 10th, 2018, adopted 69 of the 70. So we knew basically what went up was pretty much going to be the landscape. And in fact, it was all but for one rule, uh, 1.14. Um, and the California Supreme Court gave us basically five months to learn them because they became effective November 1, 2018, and they are now the rules that we are following. Next question, why do I care? Unless this is an incredibly unusual group, nobody in this room is going to suffer, I suspect, discipline by the state bar. So you care because you care, but let me tell you why you care in two words. Risk mitigation. The rules of professional conduct define duty for purposes of a civil lawsuit 
for breach of fiduciary duty. They really do, honest. You can't get me straight. Mirabito versus Licardo is the case that says so. The rules of professional conduct can also define standard of care for purposes of a professional negligence claim, malpractice. That's why we care, risk mitigation. In fact, under the Mirabito decision, a judge can actually use the words of a rule of professional conduct as a jury instruction. Think about it. That's why we care. Okay, we are going to start with what's important to all of us, which is getting new business in the door. I was going to make a little oh, comment about why am I here? <laughs> I, um, You're so, here because everybody wants to know what the judge thinks. <laughs> right, but why would you if it's rules of professional responsibility? There are, I'm coming at this from a perspective right now. I'm sitting in family law. We'll probably be sitting there for a, uh, a while longer, and I recognize a lot of people. One of the things for me that is so important is we as judges have a responsibility under our ethical canons to make sure attorneys follow their rules of professional responsibility in front of us. And that's canon 3D2. And so that's part of our job, part of our obligation. And one of the difficult things for us is there are some things also we're supposed to make sure litigants and attorneys and parties in front of us do that aren't in the rules of professional responsibility. Um, like that everybody's supposed to be nice to one another. We actually have a duty to try to make that happen. Uh, sometimes we fail. So, but that's one of those, that's part of why the judges care, why it's important to judges. In the context of family law in particular, I think it is also important to keep in mind, uh, there's the Davenport case about 271 sanctions where the Court of Appeals said a violation of the aspirational the um, code of conduct, not the rules of professional responsibility, but the aspirational code of conduct of the bar that essentially says you should be nice and polite to one another, uh, that itself can be a basis for 271 sanctions. If that can be a basis for the 271 sanctions, uh, to my mind it seems really likely that a actual violation of a rule of professional responsibility can be a, a basis for 271 sanctions, and we have a, a duty to be looking at that. There are a lot of changes that I don't think parties are aware of, or litigants are aware of, or attorneys are aware of, that I think uh, really do need to be addressed, because there are some huge shifts in my mind, of, especially particular to family law something near and dear to all of our hearts, and that's getting new business in the door, which means every new matter, every new client, conflict of interest, and we have a new conflict of interest rule. The old 3-310 direct adversity, potential adversity is no longer the rule. It's now, it's broken into actually into three parts. 1.7 deals with the conflict rule for current clients. The first part of it is you cannot, we cannot represent two clients where they are directly adverse either in the same or a separate matter. That's not new. That's flat versus superior court. It's been the law since, it's, it's been the conflict rule in California since 1994. The new one, if there is a significant risk that my representation of either client, where I have multiple clients, multiple meaning more than one, will be materially limited by my responsibility to or my relationship with, and here we have a laundry list, another client, a former client, some third person, or my own interest. I need the informed written consent of both clients. Think of the breadth of that. Another client, a former client, of some third person or my own interest, think of the information that now should, if you're, one is really going to exercise informed judgment under this part of the new conflict rule, the data that is going to have to be in our conflict checking systems. The third part of the rule, 
even if there's no significant risk of a material limitation, if either I or somebody in my law firm has or I know has had some legal, business, financial, professional, or personal relationship or a responsibility to or relationship with a party or a witness, I at least have to give written disclosure. That's the old 3-310B written disclosure, but no informed written consent is required. And then, if I can get over all three of these, A, there's no direct adversity, B, there's no material limitation based on any of those relationships, C, I didn't have to do any written disclosures because of any relationships of either me or anybody in my firm. I still can't take the matter on unless, one, I am competent to do it, new rule 1.1. I feel that I can exercise my responsibilities with diligence, the new rule 1.3. The representation is not prohibited by law. There are some representations that are prohibited by law. And I'm not trying to represent a plaintiff and a defendant in front of the same tribunal in the same matter, which would frankly be bizarre, but that's now also in the rule. Okay, that's the new conflict rule. And the amount of judgment, I think, I'll just suggest to you, the amount of judgment it is now going to impose on us if we're going to do it right is significant. What about former clients? This is rule 1.9. If I am going to represent a new client in a matter that is either the same or substantially related to something, a matter where I represented a former client, and they're materially adverse to each other, then I need the informed written consent of my former client as well as my current client. Again, it's an informed written consent rule. Um, second part of it, if the matters are the same or substantially related and the firm that I was formerly associated with had a represented a client the, in a relationship that was materially adverse to the new client, and I received confidential information, information subject to Business and Professions Code 6068E1, or governed by Rule 1.6, the new confidentiality rule, I again need the informed written consent of my clients. So, you can kind of see how all of these rules, uh, as His Honor and I were discussing as just before we started, you know, really interlace, you know, confidentiality, competence, diligence into things like the conflicts rule. Um, there's the imputation rule, which is kind of like measles. If one lawyer in the firm has a conflict, it has spread through the whole firm. Everybody's got measles. With the exception, and I'm not going to get into uh, eth building ethical walls, for lawyers who shift firms, it is now possible in California to actually, if you do it timely, build an ethical wall so you can literally shield off somebody who has come from a firm that otherwise heretofore would have created an adverse circumstance. You now can build a so-called ethical wall there are steps in Rule 1.10 1.10 for doing so. I just pass it on for you because there's only so much time we have. Uh, prospect, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, a prospective client. This at least bears some mention. It's Rule 1.18. .18. It's a trap for the unwary. We should all bear in mind, and this is not new law, but it's now in the ethics rule. It used to be just in the uh, the uh, disqualification cases, uh, judge-made law, even a prospective client has a right to confidentiality under 6068E1 and 1.6. So in talking to a prospective client, I've got to be really careful that I don't take on confidential information 
then decide not to represent the prospective client, and then find myself trapped, that I can now not really take on the good piece of business that I wanted to take in. So I mean, the, really the caveat is, in talking to a prospective client, really be careful about taking on the confidential information. And there are some caveats in there to protect us against people who are just out there trying to shop and you know, create conflicts throughout the whole bloody city or throughout the whole state. You know, I mean, if, if the lawyer has done absolutely everything that the lawyer can do to prevent the client from spilling confidential information, you're probably not going to be tainted. But, you know, take a look at Rule 1.18 on prospective clients because there really are issues there where lawyers can end up, you know, essentially taking on too much information, finding themselves trapped by 6068E1, and then suddenly say, being caught where now I can't take on the representation that I really wanted to take on the really good side of this matter. And as we all know, under 6068E1, it is, confidentiality is so much broader than the attorney-client privilege. It is anything I learned during the representation that no matter where it comes from, third party or from the client, even if it's public record information, so long as the client wants it kept confidential or its disclosure would be harmful to the client. So it's very, very broad, and there are a couple of COPRAC opinions, citations of which I can give you when we're done, that really spell out the scope of what's covered by 6068E1, but it is very, very broad. Uh, okay. In we terms got, of conflicts. We I got the business in the door. Very few comments on that really come in front of us. One of the things that I think it can illustrate is statutes haven't caught up necessarily to the rules of professional responsibility. I'm wondering how FLARPLs are going to play out with 1.7 uh, family law attorney real property liens with the new requirement in 1.7 of does it create a significant risk of material limitation? And 2033 of the Family Code cited to the old rules of professional responsibility hasn't been updated, hasn't been analyzed. And it's something, there are a lot of things I think will need to play out, and we don't know yet how everything's going to play out. Great point. Uh, new rules for litigators, and these are they, almost all of these are, frankly, new uh, in one fashion or another. This is the three series, the litigator's rules. 3.1, part of it's obvious. You can't, we cannot bring an action without probable cause, but they now added bring or continue an action without probable cause. It picks up that the Zamos case, uh, Zamos versus Stroud, where the California Supreme Court said if you continue an action without probable cause, you set yourself up for a malicious prosecution claim, you now also could arguably set yourself up for discipline to continue an action without probable cause. That's not really dramatic. Um, 3.2, however, is dramatic. Oh, yes. His honor loves this one. <laughs> Delay of litigation. In representing a client, a lawyer shall not use means that have no substantial purpose other than to delay or prolong the proceeding or to cause needless expense. And that's now a discipline rule. And in the hands of any creative judge or magistrate judge, that is going to be a handsome weapon. Yes, I, I would <laughs> say it is, it's something that I think is really drastic, really important to consider. One of the reasons I raised 271. And so really be thinking about what your client's legitimate goals are. Because especially in, in family law, I know nobody's ever had the circumstance of a client saying, I just want to stick it to them. <laughs> um, it never happens. But that's something judges are aware. You all have clients who are in very emotional circumstances. But this is an important rule in part because Litigation is incredibly stressful, incredibly harmful to your client's emotional well-being. 
and there's actually been a lot of research about this, and we see it a lot from our litigants, and that's part of probably why this rule is important, but be thinking about what it is why you are filing what you're filing, why you are requesting the discovery, you're requesting all of these things, is there this legitimate purpose? Because that is something that can be then looked at to 71 other types of issues. I'd also say, quite frankly, it's good advocacy to narrowly tailor what it is you're approaching, narrowly tailor how, what you're gonna focus on, and let the stuff that isn't really that important to what your client really wants go and it's a difficult thing to do, and it takes some, some practice. I, I do wanna jump back to 3.1, because I know there are some criminal practitioners here, and I think there's, it adds some discussion about what criminal practice can do and doesn't do, because it specifically talks about, you can just say you gotta prove every element, but that raises some questions about uh, with McCoy versus Louisiana, a fairly recent Supreme Court case, where the client gets to direct the lit litigation, a defendant gets to choose their defense, how does that match up with, okay, you can say, you gotta prove every element, if the defendant wants to say, the law is something that it's not. And how do you balance that? And that's something that I think you will we'll need to be thinking about and balancing those things it may possibly be that I had previously in a different life had clients saying, oh yes, I think the law is this crazy thing, and you're gonna argue that, and it's like, no, no I'm not. Uh, with McCoy, then it's like, well do I have to? Can I take this different position than what the client wants? And so I think that is an interesting addition specific to criminal law. On 3.2, go sit in the back of Superior Court when you don't have to be there someday, uh, particularly the early morning calendar, and just sit there and close your eyes and listen to the discovery fights and wonder why did his or her honor ever take this job if all they're doing is refereeing this sandbox about answering or not answering some stupid interrogatory or producing or not producing some bunch of documents. As I say, 3.2, at least now, I think does give the judiciary something to work with, to say nothing of our good magistrate judges up right across the street. 3.3, candor to the court, and this one I think is gonna cause some heartburn as we work our way through it. The first part of 3.3 is the obvious one. We cannot knowingly make a false statement of fact or law to a tribunal, no big deal. We couldn't do that under the old rule, 5-200. Or fail to correct a false statement of material factor law that the lawyer previously made. Now maybe good common sense or you know, a genuine sense of righteousness made us feel, whoops, if I made a mistake, I really ought to go back and correct it, but technically there was nothing under the old 5-200 that mandated that. Now it's in 3.3. Uh, 3.32A2 is fail to disclose to the tribunal legal authority that is uh, controlling authority in the jurisdiction. And it's just pointed out that that also may mean legal authority that's technically outside the jurisdiction if it's controlling in the jurisdiction. For example, if you're in federal court but the rule of decision happens to be state law, a California Supreme Court decision would be controlling authority even though you're you know, across the street in federal court. Similarly, if you know, one is in state court, federal authority could in fact be controlling authority. Uh, it's just, it's picked up in the comment. The one that I think is going to cause heartburn for all of us because if you practice, as we all know, if you practice law long enough, some witness you put on, some client who testifies is going to lie. Oh, or at least, make a, oh no, yeah, come on. <laughs> Three, offer evidence that the lawyer knows to be false. Okay, we can't do that. We couldn't do it under the old rule, you can't do it under the new rule. However, if a lawyer, the lawyer's client, or a witness the lawyer calls has offered, so this is past tense, material evidence and the lawyer comes to know of its falsity, so this is after the fact, 
the lawyer shall take reasonable remedial measures, including, if necessary, disclosure to the tribunal. Heartburn. So long as you can make disclosure consistent with your obligations of confidentiality under 6068E1 and Rule 1.6, the confidentiality rule. Which means if it's your client, you can't do it. But take a scenario that we have discussed. An expert witness, you put on the expert, direct goes great, survives cross, judge has a few questions, judge excludes the, excuses the expert, you get back to your office and the expert admits to you, oh, by the way, the tests that I testified about that support my conclusions, sorry, I didn't do any of those tests, but they would have supported my conclusions had I done them. The expert gets on a plane and flies back to Kansas, and you're back in court the next morning. Okay, what do you do? You know, well, your sphincter tightens, considerably. Under Rule 1.4, you have a duty to communicate with your client, so you pick up the phone and you call your client, and your client says you will not disclose that to the court, or you will over your dead body or mine, preferably yours. What are your obligations? It's going to happen, and oh, by the way, tribunal for purposes of this rule is, includes a deposition. So it's not just what goes on in a courtroom, and how long does this obligation to take reasonable remedial measures last? Until the, ma until the case is final on appeal or until the time for appeal of a judgment has run. So this could be, you know, the verdict comes in, you win, it's on appeal, and then you find out about the lying expert. And what do you do before the Court of Appeal or the Court of Appeals? You know, how this is going to play out as a discipline rule, I have no idea in California, or how the state bar court will enforce this in any discipline proceeding. This is all brand new territory. But you know, I think if anybody, any of us practice law long enough, it's go we're gonna face it. And I, I think it is a huge change. I think it also, one of the emphasis I think in the new rules is correcting mistakes, giving an affirmative duty, whereas there used to not be that affirmative duty. And I think you'll see it in a couple of the other rules. I think A2 is, is bigger perhaps than Ed does. And that's, you have to tell the court, hey, there is this controlling authority that is against my position. And I know your clients are gonna love that. And they're gonna go, well, that's wonderful. Why did you tell the, the judge we should lose? And fundamentally, it's good advocacy anyways because you might be in front of an irritating judge that does their own research and they know it anyways. And if you don't raise it, they're gonna still know about the case and say, huh, but what about this case? And so you need to know what's going against you just from an advocacy perspective you need to have your response of why this isn't controlling or why this case is distinguishable for, from it, just from a flat advocacy perspective. Now you also have that ethical duty to tell the court, there is this other controlling law that goes against this position. And especially this ties in to 3.4 that we're gonna talk about. It also ties in jumping back to 1.1, 1.2, competence and diligence. You have a duty to know it. So you ethically have a duty to know what the law on the subject matter you're dealing with is. And so it's not gonna be particularly useful to say, oh, I didn't know about that. Because then that's a violation of 1.1 or 1.3. And so that's something to be thinking about. Especially because it talks about if opposing the opposing side doesn't raise it. And for family law practitioners, you have a lot of self-represented litigants, a whole lot of self-represented litigants that don't have any clue. And so what does that then create your duty there? And how do you have to deal with that? And that's an extra, an extra hurdle I think you do have to seriously consider. And I would say this is, in my old job, I had many, many unpleasant conversations with clients uh, I was a public defender, so it wasn't quite the same as firing, though they would do things called a Marsden, and if we, there was a successful Marsden, that required, in most cases, being reported to the state bar. 
They had other ways of expressing their displeasure, um, which are delightful ways, and hopefully you don't have. But it's something that is important to do and to prepare them ahead of time for it. If you prepare them ahead of time and, and take that time just to begin, look, this is a problem we're going to have. This is how I'm going to address it. It's a problem, though, and I have to tell the judge this is going to earn us points. And it really does because some, it's counterintuitive, but something that builds credibility is acknowledging a weakness or acknowledging something against, against your case and addressing it head on. And that's, again, it's sort of good advocacy as well as rule of professional responsibility. Um, ex partes. Ex partes, yeah. yes. Um, the last part of the rule deals oh, yeah. with ex partes. So, um, yeah, ex parte proceedings where their notice is not required or given, you have a duty to inform the court of any important material facts, even if they are adverse to your client. And it explicitly says, even if they are adverse to your client. It's not quite clear whether notice is given or required would mean only in those particular types of cases where notice is not required and not given, or if it's just when notice is not required, or for some reason not given. And for family law, especially on custody and visitation issues, that's an important thing to figure out under 3064, because we don't know for sure, is it every single custody and visitation ex parte because that's dealing with abuse? Because then that means notice isn't required, and you have to tell us all the facts that are important, and there are probably a lot of facts. This is another one of those things that your clients are going to hate, and you're going to need to deal with and a, a deal with up front ahead of time. The Another one that we'll just touch on for litigators, it's fairness to opposing party and counsel, again, brand new in California. No, it doesn't mean we're all going to stand around, hold hands, and sing Kumbaya. It's not quite like that. But um, it, it picks up some of the obstructing a party's access to evidence, including a witness, or unlawfully altering, destroying, or concealing a document, or aiding somebody in doing so. I think this is going to, you know, and a document, it's anything with potential evidentiary value. I think it's going to come up mostly in the document area. I think it's going to come up primarily in ESI for those cases where there is substantial uh, digital uh, discovery, um, particularly in matters where the client insists that some outside vendor come in and do the ESI collection, screening, and production. Uh, you know, what we will see when we get to the uh, obligations of managing and supervising lawyers is that uh, we have an obligation to supervise the conduct even of those non-lawyers who are brought in to do this kind of thing. So there's a tie-in to the 5.3 rule uh, under this, but it's, it's, I think basically it's going to tie in primarily in, th in the discovery area. One that we should touch on briefly, it, and I don't even know if it's in the materials, but 3.5, contact with judges, officials, employees, and jurors. You know, most of us don't, aren't even going to try or try to get away with an ex parte contact with a judge about a matter, but the rule makes clear in the comment this also includes research attorneys, law clerks, anybody in the courthouse that has any role whatsoever to do with the decisional role of the court. And you know, putting on these programs with judges, one of the things that really gets them are lawyers who call up and try to lobby a law clerk or a research attorney. You know, it's, they wouldn't think of doing it with the judge, but, you know, if I get my oar in with a research attorney, it's now explicitly prohibited by 3.5. I do want to jump back to 3.4 because there are some things I think are critical. Um, so, one, they added some things about destroying or hiding things. That really isn't new, and 
doing that with evidence has been a crime since 1872, so it's not really a new thing, uh, but it, that they felt they needed to put it in the rules of professional responsibility, I think is important. Subdivision G of 3.4, I think is important for family law practitioners. Um, because it talks about you can't be a witness on anything other than attorney's fees. And so it used to be that that don't be a witness was limited to jury trials, things that were going to be presented to a jury. I, so I had always thought, okay, that's, that's the rule. And I got to family, and the first time I saw an attorney declaration talking about things other than attorney's fees, I'm like, what? why are they doing this? They can't do this. And then I'm looking, and I'm like, oh. Oh yeah, I guess they can. Uh, not anymore. It explicitly says that you are not to accept as testifying as a witness uh, assert knowledge about the case outside of attorney's fees. And testifying as a witness, you would have to have, uh, you're not supposed to under 3.7 become a witness in a case that you are an advocate for, except for attorney's fees. There's some exceptions if you get written permission from your client to become a witness that maybe it's okay, but a judge can say, even if it's uh, your client signed off on it, it creates too much of a hassle and I'm going to disqualify you as an attorney if you are becoming embroiled in that way such that you are the actual witness about a material fact other than attorney's fees. And so I think that actually is going to be a really big sea change for family law practitioners, especially in terms of notice, especially if we're going to be arguing about the proofs of service and how it was. Under the old rules, I think the practice of attorneys signing their proofs of service, they're not a party, and so they sort of fit that rule. But if that's going to be critical and that's going to be part of the trial, you're running a risk for your client then. You're running a risk that you're, you're going to get disqualified. Because if the major issue about something could boil down to those things, that's going to be a concern. That's going to be something the courts are going to have to look at. And I think that is a really big change in how the practice is done. And I, I, I didn't see a whole bunch of attorney declarations like that. I have seen some after these rules that were stunning. They were stunning that somebody would do it before the rules, um, but they were also stunning given how, um, how explicit the rules are that you're not supposed to do this anymore, that they still did that. And so it's, to my mind, that's a pretty big red flag and that may require some changes in how practice and firms run. It can be a different attorney from your firm. It can be staff from your firm, that does not disqualify. But the actual attorney acting as the advocate, that's going to be a really big concern. And so it may be that you use more paralegal use for some of the things that you might have been doing yourself. And I, we understand you're doing that a lot of times to save your clients money and to not run up costs, and it's a balance there. And, I, and so I that's how I usually took that, especially on service and those types of things. But it is, that's a pretty significant rule that I think people should be looking at. We've talked, you know, in the conflict rules now with the uh, advocate witness rule, the client's informed consent. The rules at the very front end define informed consent as one of the defined terms. And it might be worthwhile just taking 30 seconds just to talk about it. Uh, informed consent for purposes of the rule means communicating the relevant circumstances to the client, the material risks to the client, including the actual or reasonably foreseeable adverse consequences of the proposed course of conduct. So, for example, if I'm communicating by way of example, okay, I'm going to be both the advocate and also a witness on a material issue in a, a bench trial, uh, but I need your informed consent. I respectfully suggest that that means making sure the client understands that if I'm cross-examined 
and I'm dinged on cross-examination as a witness, it could well affect my effectiveness then standing in the well of the court as the advocate because now my credibility has maybe been besmirched and my credibility as an advocate is no longer what it might have been. And I think informed consent just in this area requires making sure the client understand that. And maybe we need somebody else to testify on that issue and it might not be me. All right, I did want to jump back. I realized on 3.1, tying 3.1 and 3.3 A2, which is the, you have to tell the court about conflicting case law. 3.1 has the part of you shall not make a meritorious or make a claim that is not warranted under existing law unless it can be supported by a good faith argument for an extension, modification, or reversal of existing law. That's the same as it was, but 3.3 A2 now requires you to tell the court, you know what, there is this existing law, and it says you shouldn't do this, judge. I want you to do this. And so that's, these are intertwined, and you need to look at how they work together. An example I would use for that is you've got a spousal support issue, supporting spouse, the supported spouse wants to talk about the supporting spouse's new spouse's income. You can't do it. Statute's very clear that you can't do it, that it's not relevant, court can't consider it. And so then you would go in and you'd have to tell the court, my client really wants you because his new spouse makes a lot of money to consider that. And of course your client does. I mean, we understand, of course your client wants you to talk about that. But then you would have to say, and the law says you can't consider it, and I don't really have a good reason why you should uh, change that law. You have to, if you're going to make the arguments, and there's some issues about whether you should, you are violating the rules of ethical professional responsibility if you don't say this is why the law should be changed and you have a good faith reason of why the law should be changed. That's a huge problem. And now you've got to tell us that the law isn't what you want it. It isn't what you want. And so that's something, these work together in very strange ways and it's worth spending a lot of time looking at how they interact with one another. Let's talk about something again near and dear to our hearts, namely money uh, and the new rules that deal with fees. A, all advanced fees received from a client, we'll just talk about fees from a client, deal with property from, some, from anybody else as well, now must go into a client trust account. There's one exception to it. Well, there are two exceptions. There's one exception. A flat fee paid in advance for services, we can put it in, the operate, in an operating account if, one, we disclose in writing to the client that, oh, by the way, you have the right to have me put this in my client trust account. Two, you are entitled to a refund of any unearned fees at the conclusion of the representation. And three, if we're talking about more than $1,000, the client must approve putting that advance fee in my operating account and approve it in writing. Absent that, every advanced fee must now go into the client trust account. And maybe some clients are going to sign off on, gee, I really would have the protection of having this in your client trust account, but I can waive that protection? Ratsalot. Okay. True retainers. Yeah, I don't know how many times, both as an expert witness and as a special prosecutor for the State Bar, I have seen fee agreements that say, this is a true retainer, it is earned on receipt, it is non-refundable, it's mine, 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 and you're never gonna get it back. And I will tell you now, that wasn't never the law, but now it really ain't. Under Rule 1.5, there is a definition, finally, of a true retainer. We don't have to look at the case law anymore. A true retainer is an amount paid solely to buy availability. 
it has absolutely nothing to do with services. So if the retainer is, I'm retaining you to be available to represent me tomorrow, that ain't a retainer, true retainer. It is an advance fee. It goes into your client trust account. A true retainer is a, and typically a relatively modest amount of money, an amount of money that simply buys my availability. Essentially, it sets up a conflict. I will be available to you for some matter, somewhere, someday, or you know, a specific kind of matter. You know, I have a New York firm that retained me just to be available to be its ethics counsel in California on the rules of professional conduct. No specific engagement, just we would like you to be available to us and something comes up, because uh, they also practice here. But the idea of a true retainer now is defined and it is really quite narrow. It is the only kind of advanced fee that is truly uh, earned on receipt and can go into an operating account. Essentially every other advanced fee now must go into the, um, the client trust account. Um, you know, it's, I, I think that pretty much covers. The, the other uh, 1.8.6, compensation from a source other than the client. And this, uh, you know, ties back into his honor. But, you know, it's not markedly different than the old rule. One, it cannot affect the independence of the lawyer's judgment. So even if somebody else is paying my fee, my judgment is going to be in representing my client, regardless of whose money it is. Two, the client is entitled to the protections of 6068E1 and 1.6, Rule 1.6, confidentiality. Just because somebody's paying the fee, they don't get to invade the confidentiality. And I need the client's informed written consent to accept, you know, granddad paying the fee, or mom and dad paying the fee, or somebody paying the fee. And, and that is how I see it most frequently. Grandparents likely paying a fee and wanting a two-day trial on grandparent visitation from the parent's perspective. Um, and so then there's an issue of how really is that truly the parent directing the litigation? Is that in the parent's interest? What's going on there? And that can raise a red flag if it's that kind of that kind of circumstance, for the most part, we don't get involved with the behind the scenes money in, in your engagement, but that's one that can sometimes trigger a concern from the court. Okay. Uh, let's touch on one that is new in California. And let me just ask, how many people here are partners in your firm, shareholders in your firm, consider yourself owners of your firm? Yeah, okay, I got news for you, bad news. Um, <laughs> vicarious discipline liability is now the rule in California for managers and supervisors under Rule 5.1 and 5.3. Yeah, vicarious discipline liability. We have never ever had it before in California. We now have it for managers and supervisors. Let's talk through. Managers. A manager of a firm, managing partner, or whatever, somebody who has a management role in the firm has the obligation to take reasonable efforts to make sure that the firm has in place measures so that all the lawyers in the firm comply with the Rules of Professional Conduct of the State Bar Act. Not a big deal. Uh, the, there's no least vicarious liability attached with that one. If you supervise another lawyer, whether you're a manager in the firm or just you know, somebody who supervises some other lawyer, whether the lawyer is employed by your firm or not, so this would also involve co-counsel, uh, the same, essentially the same responsibility to make sure that that lawyer is complying. You have you know, steps in place to make sure that that lawyer is complying with the rules of professional conduct. Here's where the rubber meets the road. It's A, it's C. I have vicarious discipline liability for the misconduct of another lawyer. Whether that other lawyer is a member of my law firm or not, an employee of the law firm or not. One, if I order the misconduct, well, that's pretty obvious. If I ratify the misconduct, 
Eh, that's pretty obvious. Or if I fail to take reasonable remedial action once I learn of the misconduct, when the consequences of that misconduct can be avoided or mitigated. I could be disciplined the same as the lawyer who engaged in the misconduct. Example, associate comes back and reveals, I just argued in front of his honor X, Y, Z, and you say, oh my God, you know, there's controlling authority to the contrary. You know, get your butt back there tomorrow and correct it. And if the associate doesn't, and I now know, and obviously I can take remedial measures to correct the consequences and let his honor know, oh, by the way, there was controlling adverse authority, and, you know, Charlie must have forgotten it, your honor, <laughs> well, yeah. And I don't. I'm equally culpable from a discipline standpoint as the associate who violated the rule, you know, 3.3. Three point three. Thank you. Three point three B. Um, this is brand new in California. How it is going to be enforced by one, the state bar and the state bar courts? I have faintest idea. Uh, we have absolutely no precedent in California for it. But again, think where I started: risk mitigation. The rules also define duty for purposes of breach of fiduciary duty. They define, in some instances, standard of conduct for malpractice, including the duty of supervisors and managers. No. Um, 5.3 deals with our obligation to supervise non-lawyers, including non-lawyers who are not employees of the firm. So if I'm hiring accountants, if I'm hiring consultants to do ESI collection, screening, and production, if I'm hiring anybody who is a non-lawyer, it's not just you know, the paralegals and the investigators, I have exactly the same obligation to make sure that they comply with the rules, and also I have the same vicarious discipline liability if I learn of the misconduct and I fail to take reasonable remedial measures at a time when the consequences could be avoided or even mitigated. Um, you know, so it applies both to lawyers under 5.1, non-lawyers under 5.2. Anybody out there who didn't raise his or her hand and you say, well, I'm not a manager or supervisor, so I'm off the hook, you're not. Under 5.2, uh, every lawyer, basically every lawyer, whether you are a manager or a supervisor, has your own personal responsibility to obey the rules of the State Bar Act. And the only exception is if it's a really difficult issue where there's no clear guidance and a superior says, I think this is the answer, do it this way, you may be off the hook from a discipline standpoint. But that's the only exception under 5.2. Um, as I said, this is really new, uh, brand new in California. We've never had anything like this before. Um, talking about law firms, there's a change in 8.4.1, which is discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. And the, I think we're good on time. I, the change is this. As you know, under the old rule, we couldn't discriminate, harass, or retaliate in a law firm, but the state bar's hands were tied until the victim of the discrimination, harassment, or retaliation pursued a claim with some administrative agency, EEOC or, or elsewise, all the way to conclusion and a final judgment. Only then could the state bar even initiate a discipline investigation. So think about it. The more outrageous the conduct, and those, you know, the really outrageous cases were the ones that settled real easy. The more outrageous the conduct, the more the state bar's hands were tied because those victims, those cases settled. The law firms settled to get rid of them, sweep it under the rug. And the big change here is now the state bar can, uh, as soon as there is a claim of discrimination, harassment, or retaliation, the state bar can open an investigation. 
if EEOC or some other agency is pursuing it, the State Bar can abate the matter and see how it comes out at that level. But it, it does change the dynamic at the State Bar, and I think, personally, I think that makes sense. It was the only time when we required the victim of a lawyer's misconduct to pursue an independent action before the State Bar could even initiate discipline. Um, take a look, I'm not gonna spend much time, but take a look at 8.4. It's a new misconduct rule. It is something of a catch-all. Um, it, it sort of ties into 6106, um, but, you know, and it's got things like engage in conduct prejudicial to the administration of justice, whatever that may mean. I mean, it's a little bit like the Delphic Oracle. Um, but engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or reckless or intentional misrepresentation. It's 8.4C. The only thing that's important about 8.4 is you don't have to be engaged in the practice of law to violate 8.4. So if any of us get caught up in a circumstance, for example, where there's a determination that our conduct involved dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation, having nothing to do with the practice of law, we could be disciplined under 8.4. That's why I bring it to our attention. So I think there's another part of 8.4 that is uh, something to be considering. That's 8.4F. And it talks about knowingly assist, solicit, or induce a judge or judicial officer in conduct that is a violation of applicable code of judicial ethics. And I think it's important to know that that's something that's there because the ex parte rules, what's it may not be considered an ex parte communication under the rules of professional responsibility, may be considered one under the canons of judicial ethics. Our ex parte rules actually, I think, are significantly stricter than the rules of professional responsibility. And so then that's one to be very cautious about, and you will find judicial officers, I think, oftentimes very antsy about things. You're like, well, this is perfectly fine under the rules of professional responsibility. It may not be under the canons, and that may be why we are being weird, and you're going, well, what's, what's the problem? Um, and so it's important to know those rules. It's important to know what the canons say. Um, also, in terms of discrimination and discussions of discrimination, we have our own duties about discrimination that are actually also more expansive even than the duties that have recently been added. And so one of the things that I think is interesting when you look at what's been added for attorneys, discrimination on basis of race, natural, national origin, origin, sex, sexual orientation, religion, age, or disability. For judges, race, sex, gender, religion, national origin, ethnicity, disability, age, sexual orientation, marital status, socioeconomic status, or political affiliation. And so there are additional things that we're not allowed to discriminate based on that aren't listed in the rules of professional responsibility, but 8.4 might get you in trouble if you're trying to get us to violate those rules on some of those other grounds. And so that's something that we have to weigh, we have to be thinking about. And it is, the judicial canons I think are very different than the rules of professional responsibility. And we have these affirmative duties where the rules of professional responsibility are more, don't do this. They're changing that a little bit, but it's like, oh, don't do this, don't do this. The canons of judicial ethics are, you've gotta do this, you've gotta do that, you've gotta do these things. We have, we have these burdens that are very different. And so that's something that it's important to know what they are because if you know what they are, then you know what helps the judge do, follow our rules and we get antsy and sometimes you may be wondering why we're so antsy and it's because we've got these rules of these canons that we're trying to follow and you're making it difficult for us to follow. Um, like we really do have a rule that we're supposed really, to make people sing kumbaya. It's not, not quite that excessive, but that everybody, we have a duty to try to ensure attorneys are polite and collegial with parties, with litigants, with every, everybody, in a way that is not in the rules of professional responsibility. But we still have a duty to try to get you to do that.
And so that's one of the problems that sometimes that conflict can lead to, to issues for everybody. We're going to now switch to the, the four set, transparency and candor. And this is just broader than candor to the court. It's uh, it really it's sweeping in its scope. Transparency in statements to others, 4-1, which again is new in California. And it basically requires us to be honest in dealing with third parties. Uh, you know, it, we should not, shall not knowingly make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person or fail to disclose a material fact, the disclosure of which is necessary in order to make what has been disclosed, almost a 10b-5 standard, not false or misleading. Um, this, again, is new in California. I mean, up till now, you know, you could go out and just lie your butt off in dealing with a third party, and you, at least you wouldn't be disciplined for it. Um, communication, and again, you know, one of the lay motifs that runs through, as his honor mentioned, that runs through these new rules is a sense of transparency and uh, a sense of lawyers accepting responsibility for their own conduct and, frankly, the conduct of others. Communicating with an unrepresented party. If I'm dealing with someone who is unrepresented, and this is going to come up a, a lot in, in, in some areas of practice, I've got an obligation now to make sure that that unrepresented party really understands that I am not neutral. I have a dog in this fight. And I'm not there for that person's best interest. And I've got to make sure that that person really understands that I have a client and I'm not your next best friend. Number two, I have an obligation not to try to exact from that in individual information that's confidential that if the individual were represented, no lawyer in his or her right mind would allow them to disclose. You know, so, I mean, it's now I've got you know, affirmative duties to this unrepresented individual and in family law, Take it away, Your Honor. Oh, it never happens, right? Yeah. Everybody's got attorneys. We don't have any self-represented litigants. I think the part about getting the confidential information is going to be one of the trickiest because think about all of the confidentiality provisions related to medical information, psychotherapist, uh, patient privilege, and how relevant and how maybe forthcoming self-represented litigants may be with you. Um, having seen many in my court, I can easily imagine you're having a conversation and you do not ask a single question. And they say, well, I was placed on a 5150 hold about two weeks ago. And you know, here's my psychiatric records. And I'd like you really to consider this medication that I'm taking. And I, I would be surprised if that does not happen. Um, maybe that's just El Cajon, I don't know. But um, it is, it's a very difficult situation for you all. And that, trying to figure out that line to walk where you are being cautious that you are not actively pursuing that, I think it may also be useful. It's not written this way, but looking at 4.4, in terms of if you received writings from an attorney that you realized, oh, I should not have gotten this, and giving that back, it, it may be something where it would be safe to say, look, I, I am willing to talk with you about it, but you need to know you have this right to keep that private and not tell me that. And so taking that kind of step, documenting that kind of step, may be protective. It, again, this is something that there's not a lot of guidance on. I do not envy family law practitioners trying to figure out how this is going to play out and work because that's, it is very tricky with the self-represented litigants and, and trying to walk that very fine line. So I, that was something really to be careful about. And as His Honor just mentioned, 4.4 again is new in California. It now makes it a, it takes the holding in Rico versus Mitsubishi, uh, which was simply a California Supreme Court case that adopted, quotes, 
a new ethical standard for California lawyers, but it was, there was no rule. Uh, and uh, makes it now a part of the uh, rules of professional conduct. Uh, dealing with inadvertently disclosed confidential or privileged documents. Uh, the thrust of the rule is once I'm reasonably satisfied that the document in front of me is either confidential or privileged, attorney client or work product privileged, and I reasonably know that it was inadvertently produced. And we'll come to what inadvertence means in this context in a, in a second. My obligations are put it down and stop reading. I'm really tempted to keep going because it's really probably good stuff in there. I have to put it down, notify the other side I've got it, and then either we work out how we're going to deal with it or we repair to the court. The court's going to tell us how we, how we deal with it. What does inadvertence mean in this context? The uh, comments to the rules cite to Rico versus Mitsubishi, of course, and they also cite to Fourth DCA case Clark. Uh, in Clark, the defense was, these, this wasn't inadvertence, Your Honor. My client stole these documents when he left his employer and gave them to me, so it's not inadvertence, and that didn't get very far with the trial judge. He disqualified the law firm. It didn't get very far with the fourth DCA, and the fourth DCA basically defined inadvertence to mean when the lawyer knows or reasonably should know that the lawyer, that the owner or sender of the documents doesn't want you to have them. That's what inadvertence means, at least for, at that time, the Rico versus Mitsubishi rule, and I suggest to you that's what inadvertence means for purposes of 4.4. There was, in fact, after that, a COPRAC, a state bar opinion, that said, what about the documents that come in over the transom with a note that says, you will never hear from me again. Um, these documents are riddled with the crime fraud exception, so there would be no privilege. Um, you look at them, and on their face, they say, attorney-client privilege. What's a lawyer to do? And the answer is, you turn them over. You call the other side and say, I've got these documents. If, through other evidence, you can prove the crime fraud exception, you may be able to get at the documents. But you can't keep reading, hoping that somewhere in there, you know, under that pile of stuff, there's a pony. Somewhere in there, there's the crime fraud exception. The obligation is, this was, again, was under RICO, and it would be the obligation under 4.4. Um, we started with getting new business in the door. We're going to finish with sex, sexual relations with clients. 1.8.10, the new answer is don't. You can't, unless you're married or have a longstanding personal relationship with the individual. The answer is do not. The whole idea of unless it would impair your judgment is now no longer the rule. <laughs> that it would not have impaired your judgment to have sex with a client always befuddled me, but anyhow. Questions? Well, before that, you had- Your Honor. You no, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I, I wasn't going to touch the I, I just uh, wanted sexual you to, relations. <laughs> uh, Ed, I wanted you to, to, to mention what you had mentioned to us when we were meeting on this about what had the most robust. Oh, when the Rules Revision Commission was going around and debating and meeting and debating and meeting, sex with clients, the diversity rule, the, the you know, uh, uh, 8.4.1, and uh, the uh, special obligation of prosecutors, which obviously we can touch on tonight, uh, 3.8, were the three most hotly contested. But sex with clients was one of the most hotly contested among the judges, appellate judges, and lawyers on the Rules Revision Commission uh, as it went around the state uh, debating and gathering comments on the proposed rules. But it, it's there. Go figure. Yeah. Any questions? I'm not 
really sure how to handle that scenario. Okay. One, it's an unearned fee, so it has to be returned. Can you repeat it? Oh, yeah, I guess we should repeat it. What happens if you have a third party payor of a fee, advancing a fee, and some portion of the fee is uh, left over at the end of the representation was the question, so that we have it you know, in the recording. Uh, and you now no longer have the contact information for the payor. The obligation is one, to return it, and I think in the circumstances, if you can't return it to the payor, you would return it to the client and leave it to the client to return it to the payor. But in ordinary circumstance, I would say you would have to return it to the payor, the, the source of the funds. But, you know, the one thing you can't do is keep it. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. No, I, I understand. I, I understand it's difficult, and all I can say is take a look at uh, Rule 1.18. 1.18. And the question and the, was. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Thank client you. calls Thank you, you on the phone and is doing a huge issue dump because they are very agitated and emotional. Yeah. And how do you s deal with that? I'm sorry. Thank you, Ron. Yeah. Take a look at the 1.18, particularly the comments. And as I said, it's a trap for the unwary. And how do you shut them up at the start and just get the relevant information, which would be the names of the parties so you can do a conflict check? And you've got to try your level best. One, each of us has to try our level best to stop the conversation and get that information. And, but you know, do take a look at it, because there are some protections in there for the lawyer who genuinely tries to stop you know, this, you know, verbal diarrhea of uh, somebody who wants to tell you their whole life story, and then you don't take them on. Yeah. You know. Any other questions? Wow. I have one. Uh, the uh, failure to correct information you get back, you had, uh, in family law, we have, like, evidentiary hearings, not necessarily trials. We're not getting final orders. We're getting pendente lite orders. And I understand that that duty exists until either the appeal is completed or the time for the appeal has run. But this is a pendente lite. We find out a witness discloses to us or gives us uh, information that they lie and understand. Some new information comes to light. What's our duty? At, when does our duty run at that point? And for your honor, do we come back after the evidentiary hearing, for instance, on an ex parte basis? to disclose that or to inform your honor that we have that information now? Well, do you want to answer the I'll, first part? I'll, I'll, I'll take the first part. The first part, of, if you look at the, the rule and the comment on the rule, it's it, the obligation basically goes until the matter is final on appeal or the time for any appeal has run. So. I would suggest to you the obligation is a continuing one that goes on out much longer than any of us would have ever thought. How one goes about it, you know, whether you do it on an ex parte basis or otherwise, you know, then you're talking about what are reasonable corrective measures in the circumstances. And right now, in California, there's no guidance. I think we're going to have to look outside of California to find out what other jurisdictions have thought is appropriate guidance, and it's really going to depend on, you know, the nature of the practice and the nature of the proceeding. I'd, I'd be interested in his honor's uh, reaction to, for example, coming in ex parte. And is it a true ex parte, or do you have to bring in the lawyer on the other side? You know, that kind of an ex parte. So in terms of how I think that might be appropriate to deal with, I think sooner rather than later, and so an ex parte is probably a very good way to approach it. I think you do need to approach it. You earn back some of the credibility likely by 
saying, we just found this out, we're setting our ex parte as quickly as we can to then figure out when we can have more time if we can't deal with it on the ex parte basis to deal with it. In terms of pendiente lite orders, so like let's especially say we're talking about pre-trial uh, pendiente lite spousal support and it's ongoing and you haven't gotten to trial, I would be very hesitant to say, oh, well, I should have appealed this um, within 60 days, and so now it's run despite him or her having that ongoing support duty based on faulty information. I think there's a better argument that the issues could be raised on the appellate side after judgment and on that issue, and so it hasn't run. Uh, same with custody and visitation, and I, I think it would be very likely that any judicial officer that later discovered, counsel discovered faulty information and did not come and try to fix that, um, especially on something like ongoing custody or support issues, would have a very negative reaction from the court. I can't, and, and this is one of the weird things about being on panels. We. We cannot prejudge cases. We cannot say how we would deal with anything. So it, it's sort of like you got to walk that fine line. I don't, I don't envision any judge being happy with that. Go ahead. Okay, uh, the question was, uh, reasonable remedial measure is the only reasonable remedial measure withdrawal, and the, my answer to that is, no, it might not be. Uh, for, you know, if, if it involves the client, and the cl let's, let's start with the worst case. It involves your client. So now you're trapped by 60, 60, 80, 1, and rule 1.6. You've got a confidentiality obligation. You cannot disclose to the tribunal that your client just fessed up. Oh, by the way, I lied. Your client is resistant to correcting the testimony. Client just says, hell no, I'm not gonna do that uh, for whatever reason. In that circumstance, you probably have an obligation under 1.16 to withdraw because the continued representation would involve a continuing breach of the rule you know, or the State Bar Act. Take the, the one I used, which was deliberately not a client and no information about the client. So I, I try to put it as far outside what I believe to be the scope of 606081, the expert, you know, the, the dude that just flew in from Kansas, testified and flew home. I don't think withdrawal there is the is required, even if the client kicks up a fuss. I think the obligation is to go back into the tribunal, and then the issue is what's reasonable in the circumstance. It might be to ask for a mistrial because your client's blameless. Now the judge may look at you and say, you want what? Call your next witness. But that may be the best way to protect one's client, and of course you're gonna to have to disclose to the, the court why you want a mistrial, you know, and if the court turns you down, turns you down. But then reasonable remedial measures may just be you can't refer to that evidence. Um, but I'm not sure that withdrawal is going to be required in every circumstance. It's clearly gonna be required if continuing the representation is going to involve a continuing violation of the rule or the State Bar Act. That's 1.16. But I don't think it's the only measure. But really, this is, these are, for us, untested waters. And really, what we have to look at is guidance. And then the issue is, OK, there are 51 jurisdictions in the United States, 50 states, District of Columbia. 50 of those jurisdictions have adopted, in one fashion or another, the ABA model rules we marched to a different drummer for all these years. Which of those jurisdictions are we going to look to? You know, 
Florida, Texas, New York, District of Columbia, Minnesota, Oregon, Arizona, you know, the one we like, you know, so I mean it's, and we're all, you know, we're frankly, we're feeling our way, you know, since uh, November 1. Or for those of us who are ethics nerds, we've been feeling our way for the last couple of years. You have in your packet a rumination on the coalescence of 4142 and 44 and the evolution of 44 starting with Aerojet all the way up through now the adoption of 4.4. You know, that's a lawyer's rumination on the issue. I don't know that the state bar would adopt it. And one of the tricky things with withdrawal is you can't tell the court why you're withdrawing and is a court absolutely going to want to know? Uh, and having been on the other side, perhaps, in a former life, it's a very uncomfortable situation when you say, no, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, we can do an in-camera review. No, no, I'm not going to tell you. And But I believe I am required to withdraw from the yeah. case. But we have trial set next week, and that's going to prejudice your client. Absolutely. I'm saying you can't tell us. Right. I'm saying you cannot tell us. You cannot say, and, and I agree with that, um, but you can't say you're why you're doing it, and so then the judge is going to have a question. But the rule says, including disclosure to the tribunal. Right. And if it's confidential and 6068, oh, there, there's can't. some very clear case law yeah. that attorneys should not be telling the courts right. that no matter how uncomfortable or how much pressure a judge gives you, Absolutely. Yeah. I, I agree with your comment that that would be much worse. And with that, we're going to have to cut it off. Uh, oh. They're going to hang around for some extra questions. We'll hang around if people have they're questions.